Hey there, my name is Megan Planahan. I am the co-owner of Houston Moms. And this month, we are bringing you another helpful video from UTMB Health, our preferred providers for the Bay Area, Clear Lake, League City, and Galveston areas. And you have seen us do this uh, every month this year. And we always try to pick the hot topics that you moms and parents want to know out there. So this month, we thought it would be great in advance of the holidays that we talk about picky eaters. And I know for sure uh, we have had some picky eaters in my household. And so we are going to get tips and tricks. Um, we are going to find out all the information of when you need to intervene on a picky eater uh, from our resident expert today. And today I have joining us Dr. Amber uh, Harefield. She is a board certified pediatrician and practices in the League City Bay Area um, in Galveston. So Dr. Harefield, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Megan. It's, I'm happy to be here. Yes, so tell us a little bit um, about your background, um, and I know you're a mom as well, so you could share a little bit about that. All right, so I grew up in this area, so my family is close, and I live in the Lake City area. My husband is a physics teacher and a basketball coach, so we are busy, busy, especially during basketball season. I have three kids, and they are their ages are seven, not seven, nine, and 11. And so especially one of them is my picky eater. So it's been fun to, fun, I say that kind of in air quotes, to navigate um, the picky eater from the mom's side. Um, I did my medical school at the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. So I'm a, I'm a DO, osteopathic um, physician, and I did my residency here at UTMB, and I've stayed on ever since then um, in my um, in my, I guess, patient seeing role, I see patients in the League City area and in Galveston. And in my kind of administrative role, I'm the program director for the pediatrics residency program. Awesome. So you cover the full gamut, including being a busy mom, um, which pretty much anyone who is watching this video can relate to. Uh, so we are going to dive in right away. And this can be kind of high level because I know it depends on um, ages, but what really should we expect that our kids should be eating? So for the most part, I would say generally a variety. So of course, whenever they're, you know, newborn and they're going to be mostly having breast milk or formula. Um, and then once they get to about six months old, that's whenever we start introducing some purees and some, some foods and some mainly kind of those rice cereals to add that iron component. Um, the, the things that, you know, over the course of time um, from six months to about 12 months, that's going to be when a lot of that variety is going to start be becoming introduced. Um, the main thing to avoid during that time is honey. So babies under 12 months cannot have honey. Um, that's because of the risk of botulism. Um, but really, there's, you know, sky's the limit. Um, obviously, choking hazards, we want to watch out for those things. But um, introducing things like peanut protein earlier has shown to reduce the risk of peanut allergies. Um, so you don't have to avoid that um, anymore. That used to be a recommendation to avoid peanut protein, but not anymore. Um, you can start eggs, you can start different vegetables. Um, so, so variety, think of kind of the rainbow. You want to have um, kind of the color of the rainbow whenever you're starting to introduce foods. Um, for most babies, whenever they start out, they're going to tongue thrust and that is normal. So continue offering those healthy things um, and especially trying to offer those things that are not sweet. Um, it's so um, hard to get a baby to prefer foods that are not sweet once they've been introduced to sweetness. And then as they get to that toddler age and that school age, just again, kind of those, those variety of foods obviously focusing on the things that are, you know, the vegetables and the, um, the kind of whole grains and that sort of thing. The sweetness, um, talking about that, I think that is so, so important because we just want them, we get nervous and we want them to be able to eat it. And so we might add something and then all of a sudden, I mean, we know like as a society, we are like a sugar addicted society. Um, and so we don't want to start that from too young of an age. Uh, so when should we be concerned um, if our child is is getting enough um, from, you know, fruits and vegetables and taste the rainbow? So 
I think one of the main things is talking with your pediatrician. So especially early on, there's going to be those well child checks in the first six months, they're every two months. And then after that, they're every three months until they're about two years old. And then it's about every six months until they're three and then it's yearly. So the main thing is going to be watching their growth and seeing how they develop. And for the most part, kids who are getting that variety are going to be following their own growth pattern. And so we should should start becoming concerned if a child is is not following their growth pattern. So for example, if their body mass index is too high, so if, if that body mass index is over the 85th percentile, the definition of that is, is overweight and actually over 95th percentile, the definition of that is obese. The reason that we even care about body mass index is because we've learned that the body mass index of a child is likely to be around the body mass index that they have whenever they're an adult. And so we want to help prevent diabetes. We want to prevent heart disease. We want to prevent um, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, all of those things. It starts when they're little. It, it really does. Um, and on the other side, um, if, if a child is not growing well, um, that's another thing that we get concerned of. And so Sometimes those are, you know, each individual patient um, is going to be different. So there, there may be something that your pediatrician um, is going to start asking you questions about to try to figure out what would be the cause that a child is not growing well. Um, and, and if there's a behavioral piece of that, if it's a medical um, concern, that that's something that, that you're, you know, to talk about with your pediatrician. And that's often what we preach here when we have these videos is how important it is to have that relationship with your pediatrician. They're really the first line of defense. And I can't imagine that those are easy conversations to have with a parent. I mean, I know I used to get really nervous. I had two preemies um, and we would watch those growth charts and, and now they're still little itty bitties, but they've stayed on the same um, path, like where that, what percentile they've always been is where they are. Um, but as a pediatrician, I'm sure if you see either too high or too low, how do you approach those conversations with parents and what should they kind of expect from you from an intervention standpoint? So the way that I approach that conversation, I think you're right. Those, those are hard. Um, and as a mom, I also know that whenever I walk in, um, to my, child's pediatrician office, it, it almost feels like a judgment sometimes. Um, not that the pediatrician themselves is doing that, but I feel like, you know, that I am doing something wrong or, you know, something that, that I want to make sure that I'm checking a specific box. And so I, I sometimes will kind of transmit my own, um, mom, um, I guess, my, insecurities, yes, insecurities into that growth chart. Um, and so, from a pediatrician side, I, I try to be very aware and, and just really to not mom shame or parent shame. A lot of times we have dads bringing in their kids um, and just really talk about why we're concerned or why I'm concerned um, and, and mainly kind of going back to those health the health um, benefits and risks. So um, I, I try to really talk about, you know, this is why I'm even concerned because another thing especially important is that we don't body shame our kids um, because I do not want for a, you know, for example, nine-year-old child whose body mass index is in the obese range. I do not want for that child to think that they are doing something wrong and to body shame themselves because that's whenever we start introducing these ideas um, and, you know, risks for, um, you know, negative self-talk and that is not where we want to go. What we want to do is make sure that we've addressed the, the situation, which usually has to do with what um, food choices we have, how much um, um, activity we're getting, and then on the flip side, kind of screen time and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we want to address that from the perspective of why are we doing it? So that's why I really try to um, hone in on the health benefits of having a healthy body mass index. And then on the, on the other side, um, for a baby who is not growing very well, I think one of the things that it's important to do is make sure we're on the right growth chart. Um, so the CDC has growth chart, the WHO has growth charts. Um, but if there's a preemie, we need to be looking at the baby from the preemie growth chart perspective. If we have a baby who has Down syndrome, we need to look at that baby from a Down syndrome growth chart perspective. And so that makes that 
just to make sure that we're we're utilizing the proper data whenever we're kind of making our decisions and whether we need to insert worry or not because I'm sure you know, I know, you know, moms and worry, it, it's sometimes hard to separate that. We're going to worry about everything whenever it comes to our kids. And so making sure we're, we're not wasting our worry whenever we're, um, and the child is actually growing appropriately. I love that. And so it, let's just say it, the parent is like, okay, seriously, all I can get my child to eat is beige. Like they're eating bread and macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some practical tips of, of how like the toddler literally refuses? Okay. Um, yes. so what do. <laughs> what do we keep doing as parents, um, to continue to introduce that rainbow? So I, th I love that you said beige because that is completely right. It's the breads, it's the it's the goldfish, it's the you know macaroni and cheese, all of these things. Um, I think one of the things to start with is to think about what what we're eating. So as a mom, I remember a particular time when all I was making was pasta because it was quick and it was easy and it. it it, it was, that's what was available. So thinking about what's available for our kids in the first place. And then what am I modeling? Am I eating a salad? Am I eating things that are green? Am I eating a variety of foods? Um, and so for, honestly, for me, it had to be a change in my own mindset that, you know what, I'm not going to make pasta every night and I'm going to at least add some kind of salad to each, each meal. And now for a toddler, obviously that's going to be a little bit different um, because they may not necessarily, it, it depends on, you know, what they're, we don't want to have, you know, choking hazard, that sort of thing. So obviously right. choking has got to check out for those, um, but just start doing it every night. So if it is a family expectation that we are going to eat something in, you know, of the color of the rainbow every night, then it becomes kind of a culture of the family. And so for me personally, it, it started with just adding a salad every night. And so we started with just plain old romaine lettuce and some <laughs> tomatoes with some Parmesan cheese and some ranch dressing. And wow. that just became the, this is what we're going to do. Um, then depending Depending on the age of your toddler, you may or um, you may be able to get them involved that they're putting the salad together. Maybe it's a, maybe it's just a fruit salad. You know, maybe it's um, some mangoes and some blueberries and some cottage cheese, that sort of thing. But then, but getting them involved kind of gives them that sense of pride that, oh, I've made this. And then at the dinner table, oh, look what so-and-so made. This is so good. And so that just gives them that sense of I'm part of this. I am contributing to our meal. And and if that is available and they're proud of it versus the chicken nuggets, then they're going to be more likely to, to at least taste it. And that, that, that's another thing. We, it, it's not that they're just going to comply every time, but at least getting their palate used to something that's different. Um, at times, we may just have to not have chicken nuggets available, um, not have macaroni available, because if it's not available, at first, the tantrums are going to happen. I had this happen with my um, my, whenever my youngest was about two, it was actually over juice. And I recognize that if she knows it's there, she's going to throw a fit. Even if she doesn't know it's there, she's going to throw a fit because she expects it. And so that was a, a mom moment when I realized I just need to have this not available. So it's not even an option and not even a negotiation. Um, if she's going to throw her tantrum, she's going to throw her tantrum. And then she's going to realize we don't have it. <laughs> so in order for her to have something, it's going to be what we have available. Such great tips. And I think the empowering of um, them being able to choose what they're going to eat, putting out options. And um, I just remember putting out one option I knew that they would eat. So they're not going to starve to death, mm -hmm. but then having other options available. I also like to take them to the grocery store when they were little um, and let them pick out something new, you know, some sort of new color, some sort of new fruit. And then it, it lands on the table and they feel proud because it's the one they chose. And I guess one other thing, my, um, my preschool teacher used to say they had to take a no thank you bite. And, 
you know, they didn't have to eat the whole thing mm -hmm. and they didn't have to sit there until the end of dinner uh, where tears and meltdowns and all of that, but you had to have a no thank you bite. And so, you know, sometimes we might be sitting there for a little while for the no thank you bite, uh, but we still do that today and mine are 11. So um, I think those are all great tips that you provided as well. Uh, so going back a little bit to the more serious. So let's say there really is like, this child is just not going to eat anything else. And we are maybe doing, you know, two food groups. What, what are your recommendations then to the parents? Are there specialists that can be referred to that can help them? Is it sometimes like an occupational therapy thing? Like what's happening? Right. So if you're running into a situation where you have continually tried new things and you're just not getting any buy-in, then that's definitely a time to bring that up to your pediatrician. Um, we do have language pathologists and a speech therapist who are also trained with helping with food. And so that is something that's important to explore. There are some kids who may have a, just a behavioral um just something behavioral going on that needs to be explored further. And that's, again, a conversation um, for each individual you know, parent to have with their pediatrician about their child in order to then start um, therapy if it is needed. Um, there may even be a some some kind of um, diagnostics that have to um, kind of be considered um, and that also you know maybe there's a swallow study or something that needs to to happen just to figure out which route to go down is this purely behavioral or is there some kind of anatomic or medical reason for this child to be really avoiding certain types of foods so Therein, again, lies the key, talking with your pediatrician. So it may not be a hopeless situation where it's just throwing up your hands and saying, my kid's just never going to eat this, but there are people in place to help. And that's what I love so much about UTMB is y'all have those specialists in place to refer them out if you think it might be leaning um, in one of those directions so that parents um, can find that help. Because I do think, you know, food becomes a stressor. It can be in a household. Mealtime becomes a stressor. And um, with all the other stressors we have in the world, we don't need mealtime to be another one of them. So it's good that there's hope for that. Speaking of stressors for mealtimes, we know what's coming up. Um, we have Thanksgiving and Christmas meals and holiday meals on the horizon. What are some of your tips for navigating this holiday season? Uh, what advice would you give to parents? Okay, so I guess my first tip is to allow yourself to enjoy <laughs> those times. Um, give yourself some grace um, because that's what this time is for. It's for being together. It's for enjoying, um, you know, different cultures are going to celebrate differently. And I think that's so important for our children to be able to to, to be able to learn those traditions um, of each family. So, so that's my first tip, Grace. Um, the second tip I have is don't go hungry. So, so if you are, you know, you know that you're about to go to a big meal, eat something that's healthy, um, have your child eat something that's healthy before going. So you're not feeling ravenous, <laughs> ravenously yeah. hungry before going. And then that way you're able to enjoy and your child is able to enjoy that gathering in moderation. Um, I think it's, I think it's completely fine to, you know, sample all of the different foods that everybody has made. Of course, if, you know, in, in some cases, it, it's almost an obligation <laughs> to, to sample everything <laughs> that somebody has contributed to the meal. Um, okay. But I think that that is, a, it's, it's a fun time and it should continue to be a fun time. Um, and so obviously, you know, if there's, if there's, um, you know, any type of allergies, you're going to want to note that um, and communicate with your family members or your friends who are going to be joining the meal if there's a peanut allergy or, you know, some kind of allergy just to have um, something that your child is able to, um, to add, you know, to their, to their plate and be able to enjoy with those things. I love that. And I think what you said about enjoying the holidays and really just kind of embracing the traditions that, you know, your family has 
I think is so important. I know my daughter is super excited to go into town and make Gigi's mashed potatoes. She looks forward to it every year. And that therein lies another opportunity to introduce your child to, to new and different foods that they might not have all the time. If they see Gigi making it, uh, they may want to enjoy it later on too. So um, maybe, you know, sneak Gigi's pea casserole in there or something, something of color. Um, so great tips there. Enjoy the holiday season. Uh, Dr. Herfell, is there anything else you would like to share in the realm of, of picky eaters and just an encouragement to moms out there who are, who are in the trenches of dealing with this? I guess one of the main things is to just keep going. Just keep offering things that you know are healthy. Please don't take it personally when your toddler throws it back at you um, because that is this is all part of them growing up. Um, as you talked about earlier, it can be a stressful time. Kids learn pretty early on that they can have some autonomy over their food. And so that's, um, that's a lot of times what they use, you know, whenever it comes to learning kind of where they're at, um, how they can use their autonomy. And so it's just a developmental um, process that they're going to go through. And so just continue modeling those behaviors and offering those things are help that are healthy um, and, and not taking it personally. Another thing that I think is so important for, um, for moms and for parents in general is do not um, mom or parent shame yourself and do not mom or parent shame somebody else. We're all going through this together. We're all trying to navigate. This is a hard thing, and we all want to do our best for our kids, and so um, whenever you start hearing that self-talk inside, please just squash it out because um, name it and, and, and just squash it out because, um, you know, again, as a mom, we're all doing our best for our kids, and there's really no room for the, for the mom shaming. Those words, I think, just blessed every mom's heart in Houston, because so often I think we tie our identity into how our kids are doing and functioning and whatever. And if they're not, if it seems like they're not doing the same things as everyone else, and we typically do take that super personally. And uh, so, yep, we're going to keep on offering the good stuff of, and it gets better as an encouragement too. I mean, I think in the vast majority of cases, you may always have a, a child who's a little bit pickier and may not um, want little bits of tomatoes in their meal or whatever. Uh, but I think it does get easier and our kids get more adventurous if we stay the course, right? Perfect. Well, I am so thankful you could join us this morning and share all these really helpful tense tips, especially as we head into the holiday season. As always, I'm going to drop in the comments below how you can connect with a pediatrician like Dr. Harefield down in uh, the Bay Area in Galveston, Leak City, Clear Lake. They're all over the Southeast, y'all, and you can find a pediatrician. If you don't have one that you can have an open dialogue with like this, I would encourage you to check out that link so you can find um, the help and comfort and support that you and your child need. So uh, Dr. Harfield, thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Megan, for the opportunity. Y'all have a great week and we will see you next time with another video from UTMB Health, our preferred provider for the Southeast Bay Area. Thank you.